Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for what will be an interesting discussion around an inflection point we're seeing in remote patient monitoring using wearable technology. My name is Ryan Crodel. I head up marketing at Valencell, a company that makes biometric sensor technology for wearable devices, and very happy to be joined by Matt Eisendrath from Altran. And Matt, I'll hand over you to introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, just to echo what Ryan said, you know, we're, we're seeing some exciting things happen in the market and, and excited to, to walk through some of our observations with you and, and hopefully engender some conversations to come. Uh, we want to start by um, looking at some key takeaways. Uh, really, you know, what do we see as, as some of the key and most salient points? Uh, one of them is that consumer and medical wearables are rapidly converging. Um, and I think you can see this in the marketplace with, with things like the Apple Watch and other wearables moving uh, into more of a medical grade space or being leveraged for medical use cases. Um, all of this is really being accelerated by COVID-19. Uh, the ability to practice medicine and, and provide healthcare in a uh, remote uh, situation is something that we, we've all been forced to deal with, but it's really accelerating some exciting areas, uh, in particular around remote patient monitoring. And then, you know, the, the fact is that uh, the technology is here and ready. This is not something that needs to be invented. It, it really is about taking existing components and putting them together uh, to support the use cases that, that are most fitting. Um, and it, it's really about these complete systems that we'll go into more detail about uh, that enable uh, people to go about their lives in relatively uh, normal uh, ways that they would, but at the same time collecting information uh, that are leading to actionable insights. Uh, and then last but not least, this is really just the beginning, right? We're, we're talking about, you know, really through COVID-19 and, and, and a, a direction that we're heading in anyway, um, getting to a point of, of establishing some basic uh, use cases around uh, remote patient monitoring and, and healthcare from a distance. But what it opens the door for is really well beyond some of these, these basic use cases. Uh, Ryan, maybe you can talk us through some of the convergence that we're seeing here in consumer and, and medical devices. Yeah, so uh, and the interesting thing is this has been going on for several years now, probably four or five, six years or beyond at this point, where um, the consumer wearables market and health and medical devices have been converging. And um, you look at any of the recent announcements from the major consumer wearables companies, Apple, Fitbit, Garmin, Google, you name it, they're all becoming personal health devices, if not outright medical devices in some cases. And that certainly got the attention of the health and medical device companies and sector as well. And you're starting to see those companies make devices that are intended to be worn outside of a medical facility, both of which are converging on this same point of uh, enabling individuals to, uh, to take advantage of some of these capabilities that have previously only been available in health and medical facilities to um, uh, to really take more control over their their personal health and wellness, uh, bridging this gap between the two and really going after this requires a pretty unique capability uh, and mix of consumer device uh, capabilities and making devices that people actually want to wear, uh, but then also understanding the the clinical validation and the data support and the proof of outcomes that's required in regulated medical devices. And so um, while this has been going on uh, for several years now, it has certainly uh, accelerated in this environment. And Matt, maybe you can walk us through a little bit uh, of that context. Sure, I mean, some interesting things have happened uh, in response to uh, COVID-19. I think one of the most significant things in the US is that, that very early on, uh, on March 6th, Congress uh, expanded coverage, reimbursement coverage, for telemedicine in the face of COVID. And, and that really broke through a barrier that has long existed, uh, barriers in terms of telemedicine in general and, and this you know, remote uh, healthcare, but also you know, things like being able to practice medicine across state lines uh, when these barriers get reduced. And, and one of the things that we need to all keep an eye on is that the benefits that were put in place on March 6th uh, we're set to expire on July 25th, and, and, and the belief is that this will be extended. 
uh, but that, that's an, in, an important milestone. Um, you know, now that uh, this use case and the use of the technology for uh, remote healthcare and telemedicine has been proven, I think th there's been a lot of surprise at how effective it's been, quite frankly, um, that it has a role through fee-for-service with traditional reimbursement, but also there's a lot of performance-based contracts where it's really uh, healthcare systems and physicians get paid a lump sum to manage a population of patients. And with this tool that is really a low-cost and efficient tool, I, I think whether the reimbursement continues or not, which we expect it to, uh, we, we, we will say it playing a role. Um, you know, I think it's important also to mention that you know, the, the patient monitoring and the data it generates um, is needed to really take advantage of the, the, the full possibilities here around telehealth. Um, you know, and, and last but not least, just to, to put things in context a little bit, um, really remote patient monitoring is a segment of overall telehealth. And, and, and that's what we're focusing on today, but really we're seeing a boost uh, all around in, in telehealth uh, more broadly and, and some exciting things in remote patient monitoring specifically. Indeed. And much of that has really been accelerated in this uh, in this current pandemic environment and the usage of that uh, those capabilities and uh, telehealth and re remote patient monitoring deployment in particular has, has really skyrocketed in um, in this current context. And you're seeing things that would have taken months or years uh, now done in days and weeks, and, and the amount of uh, usage of these telehealth and remote patient monitoring systems really just uh, accelerating at an ex exponential rate. You see some of the quotes there from a GP in, in London and, and the dean of the Stanford Medical School seeing um, rapid advancements that they didn't think would be possible, any of us really thought would be possible in um, uh, that happening in in a very short time frame, and as um, as Matt touched on, the the regulatory barriers to uh, telehealth and remote patient monitoring fell pretty quickly in this environment. And one of the key questions is going to be, what does that look like if they come back? What does that look like? Do they come up back to the same level they were before? Uh, does it stay where they are in terms of a, a, a more relaxed regulatory environment or some combination thereof, but uh, as Matt touched on, there's um, there's an imminent deadline coming up that uh, many expect to be at a minimum extended uh, for a certain time frame to give uh, more discussion around what that regulatory environment is going to look like uh, in a post-COVID, uh, if there is such a thing, environment. And um, you're seeing a lot of stakeholders uh, getting involved to try to uh, try to make sure that their their uh, understanding and the experience in using these capabilities is is being shared with uh, with lawmakers to to help shape some of that uh, regulatory environment going forward. So um, I wanted to to showcase some of the some of the very real examples that. Uh, highlight uh, the the use of wearable devices in these remote patient monitoring and symptom tracking scenarios, uh, going all the way back to to April of this year, which seems like a long time away in this environment. But uh, it was it was just in April where Scripps Research announced uh, an app based uh, research program to identify COVID symptoms using uh, wearable device inputs that fed into a mobile app to be able to. Um, identify the emergence of uh, not just COVID-19, but also uh, influenza and other um, uh, other fast-spreading illnesses. Since then, you've seen organizations like the West Virginia uh, School of Medicine and the, the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute um, showcase some, uh, via a very similar study, showcase some very interesting results um, in the form of being able to uh, identify uh, COVID-19 symptoms up to three days in advance of uh, an actual diagnosis, and in in the context of a of a viral progression like this, three days is is uh, quite a bit of time. And you're seeing now um, uh, sports leagues like the NBA using similar technology, uh, in this case the Aura Ring, 
to uh, do what is effectively remote patient monitoring in monitoring every one of the players in that league as they try to come back and, and have some form of, of basketball season this year, but uh, doing so in as safe a way as possible in monitoring each one of those players to try to identify any deviations from their baseline and any symptoms that emerge so those can be addressed rapidly and uh, limit, if not prevent, the, the spread throughout the entire league. And you're certainly seeing other uh, scenarios with wearables and remote patient monitoring outside of the context of, of COVID tracking in, in terms of uh, tracking general wellness and at-risk populations and looking at respiratory conditions like asthma and COPD, looking at chronic disease tracking like uh, with uh, diabetes and, and other chronic conditions along those lines, as well as neurological conditions, uh, Parkinson's being a, um, a showcase example of that. So uh, with, with those examples, I wanted to, to talk through a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail as to what that end-to-end -end data flow looks like from the sensor out to the user experience. And I'll actually talk about this in the reverse. And, Starting with that user experience, in this case, we're talking about a remote patient monitoring scenario that um, is uh, trying to do um, uh, at a minimum symptom tracking, but also could be expanded to uh, some of the other things I just mentioned in terms of chronic disease tracking as well. Um, but what we see that where we see the best outcomes is starting with the end in mind. What, what problems are you trying to solve? What outcomes are you trying to deliver? and then working backwards from there to determine what assessments are required in order to generate that user experience, impact that outcome for those patients. And then looking at those assessments, then what directly measured metrics do you need from the wearable device and more specifically from the sensor technology embedded in those wearable devices in order to generate those assessments which help deliver those, those outcomes and, and help impact that patient experience. So to look at a, at a more specific example, let's take symptom tracking. Um, since we're, uh, a lot of us are talking about this in the, in the context of COVID, uh, let's just keep this very simple and, and say we're just gonna do some symptom tracking with a wearable device with rem in a remote patient monitoring context. In order to do that symptom tracking, you're probably gonna want assessments of uh, baseline resting heart rate and obviously deviations from that baseline uh, as an indication of, of viral infection or some other, uh, some other stress on the body. Uh, heart rate variability or HRV here is, um, is a measure of either psycho, uh, psychosocial or, or uh, physical stress on the body and, and uh, bodies respond, uh, bodies with illnesses or fighting off illnesses respond with uh, with indications in heart rate variability. You're going to want to look at cardiac efficiency, blood oxygenation, in, uh, particularly with a respiratory condition like COVID-19, that's important. And then also blood pressure or, or um, hypertensive status is, uh, is an important comorbidity in this environment as well. So from there, you're going to want to look at those directly measured metrics, which feed the assessments, which then enable that symptom tracking. So you're going to want to be able to measure directly continuous heart rate, the RR interval, which is the time between beats of the heart that feeds the heart rate variability assessment, your energy expenditure or activity tracking, blood pressure, obviously, and then SpO2, which is a measure of blood oxygenation. So that hopefully gives you a, a context for how this, um, how this tracking from an end-to-end -end data flow works uh, from the sensor technology embedded in the device all the way out to the user experience and to the, to the patient experience, but that's certainly not the end of the line here. And a, a key element here goes beyond the device into the infrastructure that supports the data flow and gets that data to the right place at the right time in the right context. So Matt, can you touch on this piece a bit? Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, there, there really is some important things beyond just the, the sensors and the experience with a patient on typically a mobile platform, uh, but, but really through any platform that, that the patient can have this experience and the physician as well. Um, you need that data, you need that biometric data, 
Um, and really the mobile device often acts as that gateway and it's a gateway to really a larger platform and a often cloud hosted environment uh, that, that enables a number of things. Um, you know, the idea of a platform is that you're gathering data, not just from a patient, but from multiple patients. Uh, you're putting the data in a place where it can uh, be communicated to other vital systems that, that clinicians use, such as electronic medical records, uh, other reports that patients can, can have access to, and then communicate even with, with payers and, uh, and other type of insurers who might uh, have interest in this information as well. So maybe if we move to the, uh, to the next slide, we can you know, look at this in a little more detail. You know, what is that infrastructure and what is some of the, the analytics that that infrastructure uh, can provide? So, you know, we talked about the, the home devices uh, and these can be all manners of vital signs monitoring, uh, PPG sensor, which uh, Valencell offers in the marketplace that, that captures a lot of critical information uh, that link to a mobile application, but really uh, using that connectivity from a sensor to a mobile application, that's critical. But then where does it go? Often through cellular or Wi-Fi, it's connecting to this back-end cloud application. Uh, data is being gathered. And where that data is gathered, it can be analyzed. Insights can be derived. Uh, and, and we can learn a lot from uh, a collective uh, set of data that, that may come from a, a larger set of anonymized patient information, but then use that to get specific insights about, about an individual patient. And that can be the power of data, and, and that can be the way that these algorithms get developed by getting to a critical mass of information. Um, you know, beyond that, there's reports that are of interest to all stakeholders and, and putting it in a backend platform enables you to put the, the, the critical information into various reports and also into other systems. Uh, some things that are worth mentioning that really um, are, are critical aspects of, of these systems, which I've touched on, but I wanted to call out specifically security and privacy. Uh, you know, and, and these are table stakes in today's world. This is uh, protected health information that we're talking about moving around. And, you know, it, it, there are well-established ways to uh, get that information to where it needs to go safely. Uh, usability is critical to make sure that uh, the patients have the experience and really all stakeholders have the experience that they, they need to have that doesn't really interrupt their lives but fits into it. And then interoperability, which is really just information getting to where it needs to go. Um, you know, Ryan, I think we have some good examples if you'd walk us through on, on the next slide. Yeah, we certainly do. And, and we'll dive into several different, very specific examples that, that um, showcase outcomes. But I wanted to, um, wanted to highlight uh, the fact that there's a perception in the market that um, when we talk about wearable devices, we mean smartwatches and wristbands or fitness bands. And that's certainly a segment of the market. But when you look at the the embedded sensor technology that goes into those devices, that same sensor technology is getting deployed across a wide variety of different form factors and use cases and, and different outcomes that, that that technology can deliver. And I won't touch on all of these by any means. I just wanted to, to um, highlight the point that um, the, there's the potential for bringing in data from a variety of different devices to uh, add additional context in um, how an individual's body is responding to their day-to-day -day activities, whether that's from a hearing aid or a, um, a, a patch that's worn on their torso after they uh, get discharged from the hospital or um, an armband they wear while they, uh, while they walk around the neighborhood. There's a variety of different um, uh, platforms that this data can come from and feed into some of that cloud infrastructure that, that Matt just touched on. But let's look at some, some more specific examples of how this is actually uh, driving results today. And um, one of the more recent examples that, um, that I like to highlight is from a company called PhysIQ. Uh, they've got a um, they've got a data analytics platform that pulls in uh, data from biometric data from wearable devices uh, of all kinds, and they have applied that technology in combination or in collaboration with the the um, U.S. Veter Veterans Affairs Administration in the context of heart failure hospitalizations. And they looked at 100 patients, and this is a, a peer-reviewed research study looking at 100 patients that 
uh, were monitored with uh, a vital signs patch that they wore uh, on their body uh, for the the uh, period of I believe it was 30 days, possibly 45, to identify the the signals, the physiological signals that indicate uh, deterioration that's going to result in rehospitalization, which is a concern obviously for the patient and loved ones of that patient, but also is is of concern to the the caregivers, the clinicians, and the the hospital systems involved. What they found is they were able to identify uh, signals of rehospitalization and deterioration uh, up to 10 days in advance, and on average, about six and a half days in advance, which is um, is a huge uh, breakthrough if you think about being able to uh, take evasive action on that patient before they have to get rehospitalized and all of the uh, the pain and suffering and cost that that uh, involves for for really everyone involved is is um, a, a pretty a pretty impressive uh, uh, result here and, and outcome that they're delivering on. And this is just obviously one set of uh, one set of patients and and one set of technologies involved. But let's look at another one, a more broad uh, use case around um, telehealth visits. Uh, in the context of just general wellness um, applications or or also uh, in the context of managing chronic conditions. We see this scenario play out on the left with uh, very commonly in, in the current environment where uh, an individual patient is interacting with a clinician via uh, a, a telehealth platform of some kind. And now what you're starting to see as, the, as that uh, experience evolves and the, the um, the capabilities involved is utilizing things like biometric earbuds uh, to provide real-time biometrics fed into that telehealth visit so the, the individual clinician can see things that they would normally measure directly on a patient uh, when they would be in, uh, in the doctor's office or the clinician's office. Uh, and it just so happens the ear is one of the best places to measure biometrics with uh, wearable devices and this kind of sensor technology, so you can get some uh, some of the more advanced metrics that uh, metrics and vital signs that uh, a clinician is most interested in. So I think you'll start to see examples of that uh, in the marketplace very soon. And Matt, I think we've got one more example of uh, a remote patient monitoring scenario that uh, that you're going to walk through. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. And I'll just cover a couple aspects of this. So this is something that uh, we at Altran put together in response to COVID. Uh, you know, a lot of solutions getting created to try and address the problem. And this really built on starting with your most basic uh, components and, and then starting to get more complex and sophisticated. You know, initially, really, it was an app uh, the, the use cases here are home quarantine patients as well as non-critical hospitalized patients and ways that, that we could help support or create tools uh, to provide remote patient monitoring in these instances or additive monitoring. And it started out with a simple questionnaire, uh, really a survey uh, that, that based on answers could indicate uh, whether someone should be escalated to additional care. But as that started to evolve, right, so there's sort of a 1.0 and a, a next uh, phase. And the next phase started to pull in some of these biometric sensors that we're talking about. Uh, I mean, even through the phone, an interesting uh, one to touch on is using the microphone of uh, any smartphone these days, you can look at the sound and the sound signature of a cough and identify if it's a cough that is representative or indicative of COVID-19 versus you know, something else. And having that kind of sophistication through algorithms and through the different sensors that are available through the phone, but also through, you know, these specific uh, devices and vital signs monitors sort of starts to show how simple applications can get more sophisticated and more valuable as you start uh, increasing the, uh, the ecosystem. Ryan, if you want to cover yeah, that, sort of the, the takeaways here, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, that's and that one's a great example, uh, and really highlights a lot of the things that we have covered here. In that, um, uh, I think we've shown the, the consumer and medical wearables rapidly converging, and this COVID uh, pandemic environment has certainly accelerated that uh, that adoption curve. 
and and really highlighted a lot of the key capabilities that exist today uh, with not only the, the the wearable devices but also the remote patient monitoring uh, platforms and the ability to apply that to uh, a variety of different outcomes, not just uh, uh, symptom tracking with uh, within the COVID environment. And the exciting thing to us is is really that we're uh, we're really at the tip of the iceberg here in terms of the the capabilities and deploying these uh, uh, deploying these platforms and these capabilities across uh, a wide variety of scenarios to ultimately help people live longer, healthier lives. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up, but we wanted to encourage you to reach out to us uh, either through uh, through the meeting platform here or feel free to email either one of us directly. We value the dialogue and, uh, and and other perspectives and other examples of how you see this playing out today. We would uh, enjoy continuing the conversation directly. Um, a couple of other things. I wanted to mention um, uh, other talks that are going on, both from Valencell and Altran. Valencell has uh, another session that will be uh, held on July 23rd, 9.30 a.m., uh, covering uh, blood pressure technology in wearable devices. And Matt, I believe Altran has another talk as well uh, as part of the conference. Yeah, that's right, Ryan. We've got a, uh, another uh, talk in the MedTech Pavilion. It's called Transforming Smart Devices to Smart MedTech Devices to Address New COVID-19 Demand. Um, so please uh, check that out and, and, and to you know, echo what, what Ryan is saying, uh, you know, thank you for, for the time. We welcome further engagements. One of the things I, I enjoy uh, the most about my role overseeing medical device and healthcare technology at Altran is engaging in conversations uh, to really learn what I can from the, the different challenges that, that are being addressed. So you know, use the, uh, the link below, email us directly, check out our other talks. We, we really look forward uh, to engaging. Uh, you know, and, and again, thanks everybody for taking the time and take care.